Welcome everyone to the Healing and Freedom Journey. Mark and Melissa De Jesus here with you today. Hey, and you know what? Today is a great day. It is a great day. It is a great day because today is your birthday. It is. Oh my gosh, happy birthday. January 12th, I'm 45. Gosh, you're so young. <laughs> That's yes, how I'm gonna... I am officially four years older than Mark. I am 49. This is, this is true. This year, in December, I will be 50. No, I'm actually fine with it. Yeah, I think I'm you are. 50. I think you are, too. But you're 45. You are fine at 50. Hey, now. Um, I like that you're 45. It's like that middle. 45 is a good age. Right. It is. So we're going to celebrate you today. It's a good number on a jersey. 45. <laughs> it is. I think... Um, yeah, the 40s are a, a time where you really start mm. to take in a lot of things that you learn, a lot of things that you totally grow in. I felt you feel like in the 20s, you're just you're just you're not going super connected to it. <laughs> right? You're it's just a rare person, right? Yeah. Right. It's a it's a very rare person that's like really connected to. In the 30s, things. where a lot of wrestling, battling. Right, you're awakening to things, hopefully, of like, oh, wow, I got some bad patterns going on here. Yeah, so we'll see what the 50s and 60s <laughs> <laughs> and 70s and 80s and 90s. I think that... Oh, you want to live that long? I, th <laughs> I think a lot of people, when they... Um, just got to keep an eye on the volume here. It looked like it was okay. a little, little too hot in the volume. Okay. That's all right. I think a lot of people, when it comes to their journey... They look at their age as like an indictment against them. They look at where they're at and, and how old they are. I'm, right, I'm 60 they measure, something. Use it to measure. Like I should be further. Or I should. Yeah. I find that, you know, we're in this, we're in this whole process of talking about your family history, talking about family brokenness and healing. And I think that right at the jump, I want to encourage people to realize no matter what age you are at, God is a redemptive God, meaning that. He's in the here and now to bring healing to the past, to restore, to buy back, to take back, to restore back. He's constantly restoring and healing, and 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 that's the redemptive nature of who he is. And so I think, I think that if you feel like it's too late for me, you you come under those mindsets. It takes away the value of where you're at and how awakening can impact people around you. And so I've seen people at many different ages. No matter what they've been through, just go, you know what? I'm going to humble myself. Let God do a healing work in my life and let it impact those I have relationship with. Right. And God does a real domino effect when it comes to um, when we humble ourselves and just allow ourselves to to experience healing in our lives. So That's a key. you mentioned age, and so that was just a just a random thought. But today what we're gonna get into is Lord willing, and the creek don't rise. <laughs> We're going to talk about three areas that we find are very important when it comes to this whole aspect of, of healing your family line, specifically three areas of healing your family history. And if you're wondering, what does that mean? What's he getting into? We'll get into that. But if you're passionate about healing and freedom in mental, emotional, relationship life, then you're going to need to recognize where you come from and how it influences your, your current life. You're going to need to be aware. We find three areas that are important to understand in your family history. Because when you look at your past, there's a mixture of good decisions, bad decisions, blessings, sins, healthy thinking, unhealthy thinking. And I think people who experience, who, who want healing, mm. they often come to these points of realizing, wow, my family was pretty dysfunctional. And, and then you go through different aspects of that where maybe you deny it or maybe you go, well, it wasn't that bad. Or And the, the goal of what we're talking about is not like, really bringing out how bad your family was. It's more about seeing it for what it is, seeing for how it influenced your life, and then going, now what? What does it look like to live out new patterns? What does it look like to 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 walk out? You know, I know you're doing the, the intro to the episode, but as you're saying that, I would say that most people don't go, wow, my family was so dysfunctional. Most people actually think they're, they don't see the dysfunction that they need to see. I think. Yeah, it's really true. People are like, no, my dad loved me. He just never said it. Like people don't see what they need to see. Yep. It's, it's a typical response that we have to defend our family system. It, it's just what we do. 
And there's an aspect of it that doesn't allow for us to, to look at it with sobriety. And then there's a lot of thoughts in Christianity that if you look honestly at your family tree and your upbringing in ways of healing, mm. it's disrespectful and dishonoring. It's dishonoring right. And we really want to cut through that. Is It doesn't have to be that at all. Not at all, right. But we have to be aware of what influenced you that arrived, <laughs> influenced your current state and what you're going through. It's also not a blame issue. This, none of this is about blame. Whose fault is it? It's not about whose fault is it is. It's not about blame. It's about recognition. This impacted my life. Oh, I see this pattern in this trend. Mm -hmm. I see this. We're kind of getting a little ahead of ourselves. That's but okay. I, think, That's all right. I think that we use a lot of terms like healing, working through brokenness, dysfunction, sin. And, and what I want to bring out as believers that we need to understand is really it's about how sin has impacted our lives. A lot of times we look at sin as like, don't do this, don't do that. We don't understand that at the heart of all our journeys, sin has broken down relationships because it negatively impacts relationships and it negatively impacts so good. Like, how we- That needs to be a meme. Well, it negatively impacts relationships and how we deal with relationships, right? Because it's not just what you do, it's it's how we deal with it. How does, how does the family deal with struggles? Is it gracious, loving, but in the light? That's so good. Sin, sin destroys emotions, relationships, like. Right. We, we tend to look at like, oh. That sin, bad choice. Sin, sin over here, like mm -hmm. your bad behaviors. And then here's brokenness. So it's like dealing with sin and inner healing or heart healing are like separate issues. Mm -hmm. Like, no, it's, this is what sin and, sin and mm -hmm. Satan's kingdom has done to infect our relationship world. You hit the relationship world of people's lives. You'll get all kinds of destruction, deception. Every every pattern in life that we see. Every if you if you wanted to create a list of sins, somewhere in it is relationship breakdown and how we deal with relationships. And so, many times we look at our journey as just starting with us, mm -hmm. and your your journey didn't start with you. There's been wheels in motion for a very long time. It's good. And 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 I think it's it's healthy to understand that. But to understand that God is gracious and very patient with us. Mm -hmm. And and he is, he recognizes you carry a lot of patterns in your life. And he recognizes that you have ways of upbringing and things like that that impact you. And it's going to take a relationship journey to heal relationally rooted things in our life. Correct. Right. right? You can't, we want healing overnight. Healing's relational. And so... It's, it's like expecting somebody to be your best friend to, by tomorrow. Right. We would say that's not realistic. Well, why do we expect our mental health, emotional health are, to be like a snap of a finger healed overnight? It's all because the healing journey is relational. Right. It's like right now we're, we're in First John devotions with our kids and trying to help them understand right. on walking in the light and what does that mean? And it's, it's even, you know, helping me and, and healing me even in the discussions of that that we had the other night with right, them right you know on their behavior and you know they, we had it in real time yeah, we had it in we, like epic level real time like we gotta work with some lion here right right like <laughs> yeah so silly but those things i'm even trying to explain to the kids if you you know lie that you were on the computer or whatever like and you stick to those lies and you don't let those lies go, those lies lead to bigger lies. You know, right. you're trying to get at their level to understand on not walking in the light because then right. it ruins relationship and you ruin trust and, you know, the patterns that it sets. And Right. You said, uh, so silly. Um, I think you were meaning by that. There the was kids like, work, the, the kids stuff was silly for their age. They right. were like, oh my gosh, but we have to get serious about it. Like, yeah, because you as a parent realize this is a pattern. This could keep going. And I right. think that we're learning a lot as parents and navigating these family dynamics. I, I think, too, like there are so many times where we go and we see something in them. We go, hmm, yeah, that looks familiar. Right. Well, even when I said to Abby, like, I've been your age. She can't stand when I do that. Yeah, yeah. I've been your age. <laughs> I know how this game plays out. She rolls, okay. rolls her eyes. Okay, you're going to Yeah, me. whatever, mom. I know you're right. It's, and then I'm like, no, no, no. And it's like that that wrestling of dealing with my own stuff of how it got out of control 
because then lying became like a thing for me. I was I, a liar about stupid things. Yeah, when I was and like, you, you, uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Not, no, it's just you. And then you're you're seeing yourself in this child and going, how do I help her not become and have to go through the struggles that I went through? That I would lie for friends or lie for attention or lie for stupid reasons because I was insecure, yeah. you know. And I feel it's the wrestling of feeling a panic to help her to go. Okay, this is a stupid lie, but stupid lies can turn into big lies that then people don't trust you. You're looking at yourself, you're looking at her and to not get angry, right. deal with it. Cause really it needs love and grace. Yeah. And that, anyway, that, that was a whole circle. Well, well you bring up something that I remember when I was first doing one-on-one -on -one work with people and even doing like parenting work with people. I remember even back when I was a youth pastor there was a disconnect many people had when they would look at their kids' behaviors and yeah. they would scratch their heads and like, I don't understand why they're doing that. And, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm sitting back and I'm like, we don't want to shame anyone, but you're sitting there going, you, I, I knew for a fact you did the same thing. Right. <laughs> like somebody that I knew, like, right. like you were the same way. You don't, you don't see it. Cause there's, there's, there's an aspect where, We've not been trained and equipped, and that's showing us. We're not trained and equipped. We see our children's behavior. We're disconnected to to realizing, yeah, I know what that's like. I know what that thought's like. I've had that thought. And right. I think we either like deny it or we're, maybe we're afraid of it. This is my fault. People They're struggling this because it's my fault. No, this is not about fault. If, if you get into any whose fault it is, you're off track. You're right. going you're gonna, to you're gonna miss the whole right. thing. It's, a, it's about recognition. Right. That pulls the cover back on how we deal with pain and shame and guilt and the whole kit and caboodle. But if I recognize, if I see a pattern and I go, man, I, I know what that thought's like. It positions me in grace to somebody to be mm -hmm. kind and, you know, how do I, how do I become a vessel of grace for other people? It comes out of how I see myself. Correct. And so- right. My parenting, I have to see that. I have to see that with my own parents. I have to see that with the generations I come from, right? Otherwise, we can we can kind of we can really get off the rails with shame and blame, and then I, that that just gets us down really unhealthy mm -hmm. places in our life and our journey. But speaking of getting off the rails on, on the rails, <laughs> the best way I could summarize these three areas is when you're born into this world, it life doesn't the way you think and the patterns in your life didn't just start with you. There's these rails like you're kind of brought into that you flow through it in your childhood and you respond to. And usually it takes until later in adult years to recognize areas of our life that need renewal, that need reparenting, that need new references. And this really hits at the heart of what our journey has been and what we come from. And so if I was to summarize the three areas quickly, and then we'll, we'll kind of review them, talk about them, and then we'll get into them deeper in future episodes. This is just kind of the primer because we have so much we're, we're, we're going to cover. But what we want to do is want to marinate through these issues. We don't want to like fast food drive in kind of speed through it. The three areas are really your family tree. We're talking about generational patterns, talking about genetics. We're talking about inherited things in your life. Two is your family life growing up. We could call this family of origin. We could call this the culture of family. What were the values and the emotions and how you did relationships? This is major. And then three is very, very important, is your parental relationship, your relationship with your parents because they are the first human beings that create the grid of how you see yourself, how you see God, how you see life. There's no avoiding this. You can try to, and many, many people try to avoid this, and um, they either replicate the same patterns mm -hmm. or they go into another extreme and fall into another ditch, right? So... I want to encourage people, first of all, that this is not a shame thing. It's not a blame thing. Right. It's a compassionate recognition thing. So, um, so like, yeah, the first one being the family tree, I think that mm -hmm. you and I touched up on this because we, we talked about, um, 
ancestry and all, so much that we've learned yeah. just just being on ancestry. I think there's so there's so many different avenues we could go into, and we'll make room to go to go more into them. But I think that the one thing I would say about your genetic family tree, there's a mixture of blessings and sins, right? But there's there's battles you have that didn't start with you. And what I would say is to a lot of people when I sit down with them, I've said this before. I said, I could probably make your parents, you know, blush for eternity by being able to probably share what they battled with, even though I've never met your parents, but I see the biggest struggles you battle with. Right. Right. right? Does, that, does that make sense? Yep. So, and this, then this, then this is like dominoes into other things. A lot of people are like, well, yeah, I don't think my family struggled with, well, a lot of families hid things. Correct. Right. A lot of families in history didn't realize, hey, I'm going through depression. You're just like, well, dad just threw things around the house a lot. Right. And it was like, you realize he didn't realize he was going through depression and he wasn't working through those emotions and wasn't working through those areas of his life. So he took it out on the kids. Right. So we're not always, they don't, there's, there isn't a language of identification. There's just patterns that we just went with. And then you just cope as a kid. You just kind of go, well, 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 you know. Yeah, I think going back to the ancestry thing in relation to that, for me, it's made me do a deep dive into what my family carries and how they process pain in both sides, right? So I have one side that, um, I think I mentioned it in the, the last podcast, I traced my family all the way back to the Mayflower. And as a matter of fact, there was a college that did a whole uh, ancestral study on, it would be my dad's mom and her maiden name is Penfield. Well, when the Mayflower came here, two Penfield brothers married two daughters off the Mayflower. And there is like this, I have a booklet, the stuff that I found through this college and books and there's people that, that in the Penfield name that have websites dedicated to all this ancestry stuff. There is this rich history of men being deacons and leaders and military people. And like the Penfield name, um, I'm originally from Connecticut and there is like a Penfield beach. There's, there's all these things that are connected to the Penfield name that I come from. Mm. And it was so powerful for me. I even have Penfield cousins, you know, quite a few times removed that kept journals. They were missionaries to Haiti and they kept, no, I'm sorry, to Jamaica. They kept journals of when they got their kids saved and prayers over their children. Like I found this most amazing stuff and I went, well, what happened? Mm. Because if we come from all this. At some point. At some point, not too far back, I would say two to three times, great, great. Hmm. Something happened because right. it went and turned real ugly. And I won't give up my family dirt, but <laughs> although I don't care, all these people are dead. But it turned real ugly. Hmm. Wife swapping and craziness, okay? Right. And real neglect of children. And my grandmother, my father, down to all that's all been impacted. Mm. But I go, well, there was all this, but like, what happened? Mm. Now, she married Lithuanian. My mom's side is is also Lithuanian. Mm. All kind there's and I'm just gonna say there's all kinds of garbage in the Lithuanian history. And then when you go back even two generations, the wars going on, the conflict, Poland, Lithuania, Russia, all the stuff over there. And, you know, because at this stage, I can't find, because of all the burning of the churches, just a quick tip. If you do ancestry stuff, you, you can find, because of the way churches kept records, Irish, English, I can find everything way back. I mean, I'm talking like way back. Lithuanian history, I can't go back two generations because all the churches were burned. Nothing, everything's gone. So you have to hire people to go. So it's a whole thing. Anyways, when I started to uncover and understand what happened in that lineage, 
the trauma. And there was like arranged marriages and even like a great aunt of mine had to come here to escape an arranged marriage. Like all of these things that you go, what was going on that was undealt with, hid, not talked yeah. about, that I'm the kitchen soup mix of, right? Right. It's very sobering when you can even understand that piece. Like, okay, wow. Yeah, There's a lot of trauma. There's a lot of things that they went through. That's really good. I think about Is your brain clicking? I can see your brain clicking. Yeah, and a lot of different a, a <laughs> lot of a lot of different directions because I think about family history and when it came to ancestry, this isn't an ad for ancestry.com. I know, right? We're not getting paid for them. <laughs> and this the Although point of this a lot of fun. The point of this isn't necessarily that you have to go do that. But I think that there's a lot of different pathways that open up in my thinking right now. But in, in, in looking at your example and then my journey, when I look at family history, uh, half is, is Norwegian, S Swedish, half of it's Puerto Rican. And, and just this, this ancestry research alone is very telling yeah. because my, my grandmother on my mom's side had some records and that was able to kind of get the wheel started where I was able to go further and kind of branch out. And there's some records and record keeping that I could look at. On my dad's side of the family, the Puerto Rican side, it was nearly <laughs> impossible to find records of my grandfather and his family. Well, and right? we found out well, too. Because you helped me with this. And it was yeah. like, it was like. They don't go and document a birth because you have to walk into town and let the registrar know, mm -hmm. which is just written on some piece of paper. Right. Like, hey, this kid was born. Because I think in your dad's. Right, exactly. <laughs> this is a whole story. But with my dad. Celebrating his birthday on the birthday that's not his actual birthday. Right. We, we celebrate. <laughs> Growing up, we celebrated my dad's birthday on a certain date. And that's not his birthday. And and like, I think like when he turned, when he's in his 60s. Like just recently. One day he was just like, hey, by the way, I wasn't born on that day. Right. We're like, wait, what? We've been celebrating it a week apart yeah and because the week apart is when his mother or whoever went to the town register and was like hey juan was born right and so they put it on the day that they went into town right <laughs> it's crazy. right so and then i want to say to your dad do you really know like is you they like what is your real but does he really know or was that just something he was told like right. who knows right i and i so and there was what 16 siblings anyways so 16 siblings that's right. On a farm with no money. So they, okay. So like both my parents had very early deaths. Your um, grandparents. Uh, my parents' parents. Yeah, right. Yeah. My grandparents had early deaths. So they're both, you know, basically. Orphaned in a lot of ways. Well, fatherless. Well, fatherless. Yeah. Um, very tragic. You know, my mom, my mom's um, father died of uh, pneumonia of, she was uh, 11 right you know when, she was, yeah very young and then my 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 dad's dad um committed suicide and so okay going back to the records just the records alone there's an aspect of looking at my dad's side of the family there's not record keeping there's not yeah and there's this thing like it kind of dawned on me one day like is there like not a cultural sense of value of keeping the record is there a struggle if of like worth do i matter Right. Well, even we right? discovered too, because you, our last name, De Jesus of Jesus, was given to orphans in Spain, which we traced the origins of Spain, where right. all these babies were orphaned, and that's the name they were given. That's the best I could come up with was- Of was, where was De was Jesus the, came from. Yeah, like De Jesus or De La Cruz or those kind of names, which mean like of, of Jesus, of the cross. Right. Um, and- um, I was trying to think of another one, but uh, like <laughs> uh, De Santo or something, yeah, you know, yeah. uh, you know, where it's like, you know, you, 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 there's meaning you give, that, right? you give meaning to their, these orphan kids names. Right. So there's a lot of that in looking in the family history where it's like not documented. And there's then a lot you're of like seeing abandonment. It right. becomes, you know, I've often said recently about my journey through all of this is I feel like the more that I look and I see and I understand it becomes like you're standing in Times Square and it's in full HD, crisp, like like living color all around you. Right. And it's so overwhelming to take in, but yet you can see it all. Right, right. And I think that 
I think there's a there's an aspect of looking at your generations where you do have to wrestle with like does your life matter because a lot of people struggle with like yeah. their journey doesn't matter it's too late whatever and I look at that side of my family and there was not a lot of um healthy committed marriages right and there's this pattern of like people not committing to each other and and that made the the, the records even hard to find because you're like this person this dad this you know, over here over here right so then, um, then there's, there's, there's like things in, on my mom's side, I would see where like, there was this pastor who was like trying to pioneer something and he was doing traveling ministry. And I read this thing. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. He was kind of a grifter. He was right. What is was that? that the guy? What he does that word mean? Like a gypsy where he would just move town to town and he had like a white, didn't he have like weird stuff or is that somebody else in your, I, I think it might've been somebody else. Oh, okay. He was like a, he was like a, um, he was like a traveling minister. But he had a like. The, the, <gasps> is he the one that? That's had, where had, your family's last name came from because he married the lady with the farm, and that's how even the name might have been. Might have been. <laughs> you're, you're asking. You're sorry, asking. sorry, you didn't want a tutorial on our ancestry families, but this conversation helps because it illuminates. Yeah. So okay. Anyways, so, go well, ahead. I, so we'll tell stories, but we'll we'll try to bring it back to yeah. application. I think that if I was to sit down with anyone who's working through something, give me your biggest struggle your biggest battle. Mm. It didn't start with you. Right. Now, what makes that difficult is your family tree may impact you even being able to understand that because most generations hide things. They hide patterns. They hide things they struggle with. So this is why first John, if we walk in the light, he's in the light is helpful because it's like, here's, here's the struggle. Cause as I began to unravel and ask questions and just be curious. I realized like the mental health issues in my family, the depression, the addictions, the deep heaviness, the, you know, the, 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 I had, oh, I had this whole thing that was uncovered even recently this year about my grandfather on my mother's side and how bad he struggled with anxiety. Right. And I'm like, I had two sides of my family filled with anxiety to the point where he was dishonorably discharged from the military over it right yeah yeah because he was so yeah it was it was so bad so then here i am all of a sudden in my life dun, 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 dun. oh my goodness why do i have such bad anxiety right right <laughs> and they're like what's wrong with me i can't get it. and we start spiraling blaming ourselves blaming this and god where are you and don't realize yeah generations before you I mean, if you think about it, we're, we're just entering into the past five to 10 years of actually talking about mental health right? in, in, in the way that people do. The church still is, you know, struggling with how to talk about it or, or work right. through it. And the right? world's gotten off the rails when it comes <laughs> to mental health and what we're accepting of now. Right. Yeah. That's a whole, that's a whole other, that's other a whole story. Other topic. Right. right. And so I think that, um, I think that you have to put things in perspective. Like in the '90s and, and early 2000s, I'm, I'm in I'm in the depth of feeling like a hot mess. I didn't have things I could look up. You know, if I Google the anxiety, you know, the Google's barely out. Um, you get like some some place up in the mountains you could go to, and you know, they put herbs and you know, right. light candles. Or I don't I don't know. When, but it, and when when a generation or two before us was mostly everyone just drank. Right. You know, it, it's, it's been, very true. And forgive me if I'm wrong here and quoting it wrong, but um, I remember hearing somebody either preach or teach about this. And it made me not only think about African American um, history, but also those of the settlers that came here. Mm. And um, that, you know, children could be snatched from you, fathers could be snatched from you at any second. Um, when it came to the slave trade and all of those things, and they over time developed, you don't get close. Right. You don't get close as a family. You don't get connected because at any minute, either A, someone could die, be taken, what have you. And even when I look at, um, you know, his, historically here and people that came and had to, you mm. know, move across the country and they were trying to, to settle and lands and the babies that died and fathers that were over wars and right. killed that same mindset was adapted here. Why are you going to get close? Right. When someone could, a baby could get a cold and die. You could get a toothache and die. And so the detachment that 
that that trickled down over the generations is a massive one that I think yeah. only now we're starting to recognize. That's a big part in my history of learning. I'm sorry, in learning history, not just my family history, but history in general. Like there's a lot of dying, dying young, dying, losing kids. They just, they just, because I, I didn't understand when my parents would talk about their generations and when people died, like, like when my mom's dad passed away and you know she's so young. The way they talk about it, it's like, yeah, it was terrible. And then we just went back to work. And I, I scratched my head of like, I don't see any grieving. Right. And there's aspects of the, the Norwegian Scandinavian uh, mentality that can, that can be generational of being, you know, cold emotionally or not making room for emotions. That's, that's a whole subject <laughs> in right. itself. So I, I generationally with the Puerto Rican and Norwegian mixture that I have, you know, it's like I, I make a joke that it's like, I, I know how to live with fire and ice inside of me because you got, you know, fiery, that's intense true. emotions. That's the, but you know what, if you do your, your uh, stand up act, if none of this works out for us, um, <laughs> That's that it. is the best joke you tell. Yeah, mm-hmm. very, 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 very true. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. I that's a that's a thing I tell people is that <laughs> if this thing doesn't work out for me, I'm just going to do a stand up gig about the mix of being Puerto Rican and Norwegian. Mm-hmm. It, it, it's it's hysterical. I've gone from people can't t- they don't know what you are. They'll start <laughs> to speak Spanish, and you're like, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as soon as a, I'm like, no, I didn't. Right. We had somebody come and give a quote the other day, and poor oh. guy couldn't speak English. And I swear, due to our last name, because people even speak Spanish to me, or I'll show up to a doctor's office, and I had a girl uh, some say to me, "Girl, you're not Spanish," and I said, "No, I'm not. It's my husband." But people think we speak Spanish, which is a big right. ache in your heart that. Right. Your dad does, and your mom d- thought it would not be good for you in schooling, so she didn't allow it. The, mm-hmm. the, the story on that is actually very unclear. It's, it's not that Well, that's she, what she said. I thought that she thought it would mess with you. They they kind of thought that back in the day, that if you learn two languages- uh, Yeah, and it's like, and wait. it's actually really good for your It's brain. actually the opposite, like right. learning <laughs> languages. Well, what are you going to do? Um, yeah, my parents said a lot. We didn't know what to do with you. So that's right. that, that's a big part, a big part of my journey. Right. Um, I don't know where I was going with that. No, I don't either. But you know what? There's so much to learn and understand. And I think those of you that are tuning in to us, you're that odd man out in the family that wants to understand all those things. There usually is. There usually is one person that that kind of goes, hey, we need to be healthy. Hey, what did grandma do? And everyone's like, shh, no. (laughs) Wait, didn't grandma and grandpa? No, we don't talk about that. Mm -hmm. You're the people that are like, wait, no, we need to heal the generation. So like. Right. We're here with you. We get it. From a from a theological standpoint, we most Christians believe that you're born with sin. You're born with a sin nature. But I, I don't think a lot of believers n- narrow that down to the micro level. That really, it's about you're you're born into certain sin patterns that want right. to repeat. And there's this snowball going down the hill. And that's why you have certain right. battles that seem to be more difficult than others. I noticed this a lot too with like sexual sin patterns, mm. uh, whether it's like fornication or adultery. Um, there's 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 so much shame around those struggles that don't get nurtured or worked through, and families hide those things. Right. So then, I would notice like people that I knew who had those patterns in their life down the road, their children would would manifest the same struggle Mm -hmm. at the same time same age at the same age i even saw sin patterns manifest i had unusual situations where i knew the biological parent even though the kid wasn't raised with the biological parent but i knew some things about the biological parent and the biological child even though the biological child wasn't raised by Mm -hmm. the biological parent are you following me yes was manifesting the same thing at the same time in his own journey They've even noticed this in studying uh, yeah. alcoholism, yeah. that where they would see if you if you how how the inherited factor of inherited alcoholism, where it, let me see if I can communicate this accurately, um, where the genetic factor was a greater driving force. Right. If you take a non non alcoholic genetic mm-hmm. and put them into an, an adopted home with alcoholics. Mm-hmm. 
they have less of a chance of becoming alcoholic because than, of the inherited than a, factor, than a, than yes. a, a genetic yeah. inherently alcoholic person put, put in a in, nice home, mm-hmm. whatever. Hundred percent, right? The the inherited factor was a greater right. greater force. Mm-hmm. So right. we look at this from a spiritual warfare standpoint. The enemy's just chomping at the bit at certain areas, right? right? He wants to so, pull that trigger, right? <sighs> So then people get overwhelmed and then we're trying to like pray all these prayers and do all these things. I got to fix my gen- and it doesn't work like that. And we'll, we'll talk about generational change. We'll talk about those things. This is not about like take a class or do this thing or pray this prayer or do this ritual and you're going to fix it. This is about shifting ways of living and ways of relating. And this is why it's a journey because we're, we're learning to take the identity of who we are in Christ and the family that we are and make that the lineage we pass on. Right. We also have this family lineage. that has got a mixture of stuff. Some of the great blessings that you don't even realize, you know, there's things, even just if you live in the United States, for example, where we live, there's things generationally we inherited that like you look back at what generations had to suffer through. Mm -hmm. Like just that alone is is something to reflect and have gratitude. But there's also things Past generations either couldn't, didn't, didn't want to, or just, you know, never faced in their life. And I think that God goes, it's something that you're going to face and you're going to work through. And it'll be your inheritance that you give off to others, whether it's your, your biological family or the family of God. Because even if you don't have children, you're still a part of the family of God and you, you can leave a, a deposit. But I think that really what, what what's important is, Look at your family tree. How'd they deal with emotions? How'd they deal with relating to each other? Mm-hmm. How'd they deal with mistakes, sins, flaws? And 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 what were some of the predominant things? And if you have opportunity to talk to family members, don't go tell me the sins in the family. You know, find ways of just being curious. What was it like for you growing up yeah, as a if kid? If you got some grandparents, seize that opportunity. Oh, if you got grandparents. Sit down with them. Yeah. I, know. I never. Some, some of them are tough. I get it. I never got a chance to talk to my grandfather, so yeah. I. So I yeah. tried to talk to mine. She was. <laughs> she was. She was. She was a cold lady. She was tough, but my great grandmother, she was great to talk to. I just, you know, when she died, it was. I wish that I had. I had had the the foresight to 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 talk to her about certain things, and you don't, you know. So but, we'll we'll get we'll get more into that. Yeah. The second area is your your family life growing up. Sometimes that's termed family of origin. Um, could be your adopted family. Could be it's like the culture that you grew up in. That as a family, what was the culture like emotionally? How were emotions dealt with? Were you emotionally equipped? If you're when you, I was nurture. How were how were you know? How'd your parents talk about their own battles? Was there you know relational co- connectivity? And and this is this is important to understand because it takes a while for us to come to terms with family brokenness because it's familiar. It may be dysfunctional, wrong, sinful, but it's all we know. And when you're a little kid, all you do is cope. Mm -hmm. You don't as a six-year-old go, this is dysfunctional, this is sinful, this is wrong, this is, you just respond. And and your neurological connections get formed because you're developing. Like they even say your brain, your brain doesn't fully develop to your like what, 20? 23, 24, 20, I yeah. believe around there, yeah. Right. Um, so all the way through, all the way up into those early 20s, you're developing how you respond to the world around you. And it's heavily influenced by what the family culture was like. Because this is not about having a perfect family, being raised in a perfect family. There is no mm-hmm. perfect family. No. But it's, it, it takes time because it's so familiar. And sometimes it takes a while. Sometimes you have to be exposed to healthy things to go, whoa, yeah, that was unhealthy in my family. You said something before we, um, we, hit, we hit record about this factor. Um, is there any way you can pull back on it and repeat it? Let me think for a second. <laughs> Um, was it about understanding, like just even having emotional language? So it's, it's difficult. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Share on that yeah. for a little bit. So I, it's great to say, you know, recognize your family patterns, recognize what you, I know for me, let me, I want to be like clear in how I explain this. Growing up, I knew my family was dysfunctional. So I could, I, I, 
I was in a way, I don't want to use the word deceived, but I thought like I had it figured out. Mm. I thought I was like, yep, he does this, you do this, you do this, da, 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 da. And I could call out the pattern. I could call it out. So I thought like I knew what was going on. Mm. So I guess I could say yes to a point, but really understanding myself mm. and what patterns I have and why I do it. it. It's opened up this whole thing of, oh my goodness, mm. the patterns. Oh my goodness. Like it's really given me good emotional language and understanding. And it's done, I think a twofold thing of like grace over myself yeah. and um, helping me in forgiveness to my parents. Yeah. It's been a journey though. But back to the point of like, it helps. So yes, you know what? Know your patterns, but you got to see, you have to want to seek that out. You have to want to find good material. You have to want to find good books that help to give you language to go, oh, okay. Because it's easy to just go, yeah, well, my dad was an alcoholic. No, oh, there's so much more to it. There's yeah. so much more to the patterns and things that they displayed and manifest. Because you could have, Two homes with alcoholism that operate completely different. Mm. You could have a rage-filled, abusive home, and you could have an alcoholic home that's filled with guilt and right. loving words that mean nothing because of guilt. So you could have it operating different. Right. And you need to understand what those patterns are and how they affected you. Just that one thing alone, if you grew up in one parent, was an alcoholic. Oh, my gosh. You have a slew of oh, battles uh -huh. you most likely struggle with. It leads into repeated addictions, right. it, perfectionism. It can go into compulsive behavior. You know, where, where I, I tell people a lot who have OCD issues, there's probably addictions in your family line. Correct. And they're like, well, no, no. And, and then I you tell, and tell me about your family. And they tell me, I'm like, that's, that's addiction. addictions. Right. You know, my, my dad was an alcoholic, but he spent all his time at church working. That's an addiction. That's called workaholism. And he probably did that out of response to his dad's alcoholism, right? Right. Um, yeah, so I think that at this stage, this, this part, this second section here, there's a lot of learning involved. There's a lot of relearning involved. Well said, and, and you have yeah. to give yourself room for that. What does it look like to be healthy? Because a lot of us just don't know. The thing that Melissa mm -hmm. and I, that was great about, us coming together is we were both passionate about the learning. I at times could be more obsessive about the learning, <laughs> you know, and, and I've had, and I've had to heal and, and, and work through that. And God's, God's grounding me, but using that passion I have mm -hmm. to help other people. Right. But you've had this phenomenal openness to working through having what we call healing conversations where you kind of go through the curves, the ups and downs, and find your way in the discussion to land. And we talk a lot about landing with each other. And because there's a lot we were growing up with, I know for me, it took me a long time to, to identify simple things. Like even in, in my life, I appreciate uh, verbal encouragement. You could say my love language is words of affirmation, which, 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 you know, the five love languages is, is, a, is a great understanding. Yeah. But there's also a lot of brokenness that fuels that love language. There's this interesting pattern talking about family ways of growing up. I noticed in my, in my parents, there was a hesitancy of like verbal encouragement. This is like very strange kind of pattern that would go on. It's a combination of like their family history. And but, them uncomfortable saying things too. Right, right. but also some religiousness. Okay, and I'll get into what I mean by that. Yeah. Like a, a Christian labeled religiousness. There was a driving force and value of, well, if we encourage you, your head's going to be too big. Right? So then there wasn't always a lot of verbal encouragement. Now, I already have a big head. I have a physically big head. <laughs> Anyways, I, I, I do. I have a big head. You do. You have, um, your hat size is out of the norm. Out of the norm. Yeah. I If I go to a hat store, I'll go, I need your, the biggest hat you've got. And they go, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I go, no, no, no. Right. I need the biggest hat you've got. I've, I've got a large noggin. And I don't, I don't, mean, <laughs> I don't mean it like that. You know what I mean? When I say big head, yeah. that was a driving force. So, so many times in my life, I, had, I didn't have like certain encouragement in certain areas. So that tank is just kind of empty. 
So then over time, words of encouragement are like water to someone who's been in the desert. And you go, and that, that's great. You get that moment. Because mm. it it's, becomes an idol. it's, it's mm-hmm. starving. Mm-hmm. And now I need you to, to say nice things to me. And on the you know reverse, those mean critical things hit me all the way down to the bottom of the root system at the marrow of right. my being down to the cellular level. Right. right? And in one moment, just... So it's an understanding. It's not like blame parent because they didn't have that. You know, <laughs> I have when I when I make jokes about Puerto Ricans and Norwegians, sometimes people at the event would be from those cultures. Mm-hmm. And, and and some of the Norwegian guys would, would come out to just crack me up. They're like, yes, I know what you're talking about. And one guy told a story about his, his grandmother. Every time she'd visit, she'd come sit in the chair and she'd just rock in the chair for hours, for hours and just wouldn't talk. And then at the end of the day, she'd get up and go, well, that was nice. And, and, and leave and we go like, we didn't even talk. Right? There's all these. So it's a combination of like genetically inherited patterns, but also it's culture. It's how culture right. operates. And culture to you is correct because it's what you grew up with. Does that make sense? Right. Yes. So like you, you're not able to look outside and go, uh, there's a lot of guilt trips mothers put on their kids and there's a lot of, yeah, that's abusive talk there. Yeah. The way the father talked to your mom, eh, that's not cool. That it's not, it's not healthy. That's, you know, but it's all we know. So I was like, well, I never heard words of encouragement. I remember in my early twenties saying, I never heard of words of encouragement or love or those kind of things, but I'm okay. <laughs> right. Well, it's like the people that say my dad never said he loved me, but I knew he did. Right. Like, no, you don't understand. You need to hear those words. And it's not putting your dad on the prosecution chair. No, because it was uncomfortable for him because he didn't hear it. And da, 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 da. But you've got to recognize that. Right. You were meant to hear love. You were meant to be hugged. You were meant to be protected, to meant to be feel safe. It's not about a perfect family. It's about a family that's willing to work mm. through the, 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 the picture of family as God created is not a perfect family. It's learning how to come together in relationship, work through, navigate through. Hey, I'm having anxiety. Okay, let's sit down and talk. It's not, I'm having anxiety. Oh, we'll sign you up for counseling. Okay, that may be helpful, but that's not step one. Step one is us as a family, let's grow together in this. Right. Work through this. Um, but then we don't even get to that because people don't even, I didn't share. I have dark thoughts and feelings constantly. I, I feel anxious all the time. I, I'd have like panic anxiety attacks over simple things like going to basketball practice or giving a speech in class, torment. I mean, I would just be yeah. dreading and dreading and dreading. It made me a perfectionist. It made me like consumed with this. I couldn't even be present with anyone. And on top of it, I never told anyone i didn't know it was, right, it was I, your inner world of of just insane obsessive struggle i get that yeah i didn't yeah. even know it was an option right so i think that right many people in their history they look and they go there's a lot of trauma there and it's the, the trauma was hard enough mm. how was the trauma dealt, dealt with? with right right because we'll have traumas there'll be accidents or things and stuff that you know happened growing up or or you know Awful things that happen. On top of that, though, what was the family culture around it? And most families, even if, because I know this for a personal experience of things, even I've shared with my family, it's never brought up again. And that to me is almost worse than the trauma itself. That's awful. The people I love never mention it. Right. You talk about it and then it's never brought up again. Like like, that's, I get, and they kind of take the posture of, well, I guess if you want to talk about it, you'll let us know. Yeah. <laughs> That's that's rough. This isn't about me right now, though. <laughs> you can make it about you. Go ahead. I'm joking. I know what you're. What, what oh, you're gosh. Well, I would say, I'd like to spend an entire episode on what I consider to be one of the greatest pains of people's lives. It's traumatic in nature. It's heavy, and when I say it, people will go, "Well, oh, really? Is that? Yep." It's called neglect. Yeah. I I, I think it is. A plague yeah. that is where the needs 
that mm-hmm. God built in you mm-hmm. were never tended to. That neglect leads you so confused because you have problems and struggles, but you have n- no reference of what you're even looking to. It's like the person who says, well, I never, I was never told I was loved, but I, you know, I'm, they think that's normal. So the, that's an area of neglect that they didn't know they needed. Mm-hmm. So they're disconnected to how to even work through issues. This is a big area of working through self-awareness and like even emotional language and things and why the learning is important because right. you realize, oh my, I never had that. Okay, now my journey is to learn, relearn. In some circles, they say reparent myself right. in, in, in these areas. And so I think that when you take a step back, realize you've got some, you've got inherited things, you've got a family culture, but then where I really want to land the plane today and we'll get into this Lord willing and the Creek don't rise in the next episode, we'll get into some parent stuff. We'll probably do a few episodes just on that. Your relationship with your parents. I cannot emphasize this enough. We'll get into the whys and hows, but they are your reference for love. They are, they start the God compass in your life. Yep. How you hear from God, how you relate to God, they set the foundation of that. Mm-hmm. They set the foundation of how you relate to him. They set the foundation of how you bond relationally. And so we want to talk about that. We want to look into that. And I think that my healing journey started to really gain some momentum when I realized what I came from, what it was, what I grew up in, and also recognizing a relationship with my parents because there's different stages you walk through. There's recognition. This is what really seeing it. And many of you say, yeah, I see it. Well, you're going to need some more to see, see, understand. Then those areas of forgiveness, mm-hmm. right? And then, you know, navigating what does it look like? And sometimes in the healing process, we try to go talk to our parents about it. Hey, I learned, I went to a conference. I read a Mark DeJesus book. Would you like to read it? And then you get like, body slammed and you're like, why did I even bring it up? You know, we're going to talk through that too. And, um, if you're struggling in how to receive love from God, it's the first thing we direct people. So, okay, talk to me about what your relationship with your dad was like. Yeah. And I think that having an openness, God show me. Yeah. Cause these subjects can be overwhelming and then you might sit, you might be sitting down and making a notebook of your family tree. Now I did that. So, you know, I don't blame you if, if you do that. I actually sat there and wrote down, okay, currently, and look at my family. What are the things I see? I'm not going to judge it. I'm not going to prosecute anyone. What do I see? Good, bad, and ugly. There's many of you that sit down and reflect. What was it really like emotionally, relationally growing up? Was there safety? Was there equipping? When you were struggling, did you have a place to go to, to express, to work out what you're feeling? Mm. You know. Most people I talked to didn't have that. And then where the rubber meets the road too is mom and dad. What was the picture of that like for you? Mm. And, and, and what, what, what things came out of it? And what kind of role did you put on out of that brokenness? We'll talk about that some too. So good. And so God calls himself a father. He is a father. Right. So when you think a father, it's going to bring up the reflex of what father means to you. And the majority of our struggles come out of how our father lens was formed and both father and mother are influential in that in many different ways. So any other thoughts you have for that? No, I just want to say, and I've used this um, for my own journey and how I've understood of where my kinks have been along the road and how I process giving and receiving love with my father in heaven. And for me, um, it's been the understanding that in a perfect scenario, my parents would have been in love, loved God, my father would have honored and respected my mother, and they would have taught us who Christ is, what he did for us on the cross, shown us who the father was, shown he would have been loving, and, and all these things, loved himself and loved my mother. And, and then when it came time to show me who God in heaven was, my dad saying, now I'm going to introduce God to you Mm. and he can love you far greater than I, but I already know what that love is. So it's an easy transition to accept Christ. What, you know, (laughs) that's my, and I go, 
Right. No, that's not how it happened. So I have kinks in the chain Mm. of what that looks like for me and how I easily flow in my relationship with God. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of good stuff there. Really good. And I think, you know, I think about you and I, and we weren't like equipped with any of this. A hundred percent of everything we're sharing with you in these episodes is what we've learned in our journey. You think about that for a second. Right. You know, I had a counselor say to me, wow, you're, you're changing the generations. And it's like, well, I'm 15 plus 20, 15 to 20 years into that, you know, it's daily. And I think that, cause I've struggled too with like trying to be a perfect parent that yeah, perfectionism sneaks in there. You know, you, you get struggled to hyperventilate. Oh my kid's struggling with something, you know? And I think that I've had to just remain humble and gracious to myself and being willing to navigate through the areas that, and, 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 and God has something simple right in front of you of what it looks like to take the next step. Don't get overwhelmed. This isn't overwhelmed. This is a journey Mm -hmm. for people that get overwhelmed. They're not plugging into journey mindset or they're, you know, shaming themselves and, 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 and all that. God's his mercies are new every morning. Now is the time. Today is the day. So, we want to encourage you to just open up your heart to this and and really just allow yourself to to respond to what did I what did I carry and what can I learn to establish new patterns in my life. And I think that's a good posture to have for your life and for your journey. If this episode's been a blessing to your life, go to markdehesus.com. Melissa and I are passionate about helping people experience healing and freedom in their life. And so if these conversations are a blessing, consider a one-time donation, and you can also become a regular partner and supporter of this ministry work. If you want to take the journey, one book I would recommend is Taking the Heart Healing Journey. And I think this can be a good discussion for family members that are open. Um, I know that's a sticky (laughs) subject right there. Um, (laughs) You got to really be open. Uh, Or maybe just some friends. Maybe that's a safer way to do that and take a step to to say, you know what? I want to learn to heal. I want to learn to grow. And I want to establish new patterns in my life. This may be what I came from. It doesn't mean this is my permanent imprint. Mm -hmm. I can establish new patterns. It's good stuff. So it is good stuff. It's fun. Anything else? No. All right. I think we're good. Well, we'll see you next time. Lord willing, the creek don't rise. Mm -hmm. We're out. And uh, thank you, everyone. Yeah. I'm going to go celebrate my birthday. So (laughs) see y'all.